Welcome to Worship with the Grove family today. I'm so excited that you've chosen to join us in worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ today. We're gonna worship Him in song. We're gonna seek His face in prayer. And we're gonna open God's Word together today. And sharing the sermon with us today, our preacher is Brother Josh Turner. Josh leads church planning efforts for us here in the state of Virginia with Southern Baptist. And I'm excited that he's gonna share God's word with you because he loves the Lord Jesus, loves his word, and loves the local church. But in particular today, I wanna to ask you to be praying for what God is doing as the Grove Church family is a part of God's missionary work across this community, across the state, nation, and around the world. So Brother Josh, welcome to worship here with the Grove family. And to each and every one of you, I'm so glad that you're worshiping with us today. I pray that you will worship the Lord Jesus and know that you're welcome in this place. I look forward to being back with you next Sunday and opening God's word with you as we continue our sermon series, Forever Hope in a Whatever World, as we're walking through 1 Peter. And next Sunday, we're gonna be seeing how there's hope for every marriage in this whatever world. God bless you. Welcome to worship today with the Grove Church family.
therefore that the Lord, your God, is God. And the faithful God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments for a thousand generations. Lord, your God, we celebrate that this morning. For the same God, Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Church, you can be seated. Brother Josh, bring the word for us this morning. Let's welcome him up here. Well, good morning, church. It's so good to be with you today, and thank you, Dr. Autry, for that wonderful introduction. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to the book of James. The book of James, one of my favorite uh, books of the Bible. And it's been said that you only have one chance to make a first impression. How many of you have heard that before? One chance to make a first impression. And I believe in these first couple of verses of James, we're going to find out really who this guy is. And I believe after we leave today, we're going to see some really cool things that James has to say to us. James chapter 1, look at verse 1. 
James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's pretty important, isn't it? To the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. And here we go, verse 2. Probably one of the hardest verses that I have to read, and in particular, one of the, one of the most hardest verses I, I have to act out in my life. He says, count it all joy. Now, when I'm thinking about that passage, I'm like, yeah, if I'm at a theme park, I'm counting it all joy. Boy, if I'm at Bush Gardens, if I'm at King's Dominion, if I'm going through something great in my life, I'm going to count it all joy. Whoa, this is wonderful. This is awesome. But he goes a step further and he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect so that you may be perfect and complete. Now look at this. Lacking in, what does it say? Nothing. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this passage of Scripture. And God, as we read through this today, Father, would you let your word speak to us? Or it doesn't really matter what my words are, Father, but your words are powerful. Your words are true. Lord, we believe your word has the ability to do surgery deep inside of our heart. So, Father, speak to us this morning, and I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. James gives us an introduction about himself, and if you think about it, there are so many things James could have said about himself in his introduction. I mean, think about it. James was the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Now, we know he's the half-brother of Jesus Christ. A lot of people believe or think, like, why would you call him just the half-brother? Well, we know that Joseph was not his father, right? Not his biological father, because we know that Mary was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Well, we don't have time to unpack that today, but that's a pretty important doctrine. James could have said, I am the half-brother of Jesus Christ. You know that guy that everybody's talking about? Well, yeah, I saw him grow up. I was in his household. I'm that guy. I'm the guy that got more timeouts than Jesus, probably. I'm just guessing. I'm that guy. He could have used all of those things. If you also remember, James was a skeptic of Jesus Christ. In other words, James thought his brother was crazy, like maybe most siblings do from time to time. He didn't believe. He wasn't a believer until, of course, we know, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, something changed his life forever. James saw the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, and it affected his whole life. James was also a leader in the church of Jerusalem. He could have said that in his introduction. I am a leader in the church. Yes, that's who I am. I have credentials. I have access to the thermostat in the church. No, just plain, you know, you see what I'm, I mean, there are all kind of things he could have said. Think about all the titles that he could have used to describe himself. You know, sometimes I have to chuckle at titles. Titles for ministry leaders. He could have said Apostle James. He could have said the right Reverend Dr. James. Bishop James, Pastor James, he could have used. Consider some more that we find out. Chief Apostle, Senior Apostle, Head Apostle, Lead Apostle, Senior Prophet, Head Prophet, Visionary, Lead Visionary, Visionary Apostle, and I mean the list could go on and on about titles. The world's full of titles, isn't it? And sometimes people are just really into their titles. 
It's really into what you call me. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the most titled person in the world is a lady by the name of, she's the 18th Duchess of Alba, Doa Mara del Rosario, Cassia Fitz, James Stewart, Y. Silva. Forgive me for mispronouncing her name, but just like all these names. She is 14 times a Spanish grandee, five times a duchess, once a countess duchess, 18 times a married chonus, whatever that is, 18 times a countess, and once a visco countess. Can you imagine her business card? Oh, titles. Titles remind me of the professional social platform called LinkedIn. How many of you ever, been, have you ever looked at LinkedIn? Maybe some of you are on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, I see it everywhere. I think it's spam mail, but it's actually something. But LinkedIn describes itself as a place well suited for personal branding which according to Sandra Long entails actively managing one's image and unique value to position oneself for career opportunities. LinkedIn has evolved from being a mere platform for job searchers into a social network which allows users a chance to create a personal brand. That's what everyone needs is a personal brand. Career coach Pamela Green describes a personal brand as the, quote, emotional experience you want people to have as a result of interacting with you. Whew, that's a lot to think about. As I meet you today, perhaps many of you for the first time, I'm thinking, if according to LinkedIn, I should think about what kind of emotional experience should we have today? And the LinkedIn profile is an aspect of that. And here in James chapter 1, we come to what could be referred to as his personal branding account, his LinkedIn account that made the pages of Scripture. Work with me a little bit. What was his branding? What What did he want his readers to know about him? What did the Spirit speak to him to write down? What kind of emotional experience did James want his readers to have as a result of interacting with him? Well, James 1.1 gives us his title. It gives us exactly what the Spirit wanted you and I to know about James. Now, hang on, it's not long. It, it, It wouldn't fill up a business card. But in James 1.1, we read James, a what? A servant. A servant. A servant. But not just any servant. Because all of us, if we're honest, we serve something, right? We're serving something. But James didn't just want us to know that he was a servant. But he was a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only title, the only title that James had in verse 1 was the title of servant. You know, Jesus had something to say about titles. Jesus had a lot to say about self-promotion and maybe personal branding. We all know the passage of Scripture in Matthew 23, verse 1 through 12. Jesus talks about it. Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees, titles, sit on Moses' seat. And then he says, so do and observe what they tell you, but don't do what they do. For they preach, but they don't practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the people's shoulders, but they themselves aren't willing to move any of those with just their finger. Verse 5, they do all their deeds for one reason and one reason only, to be seen by others. It's called personal branding. It's what they do. They're interested in only promoting themselves. For they make phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at the feast and best seats in the synagogues 
and greetings in the marketplaces and being called, here we go, another title, they enjoy being called by a name, rabbi, by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, and his name happens to be what? Christ. And then look at verse 11. We see the same theme all throughout Scripture, not just with James. The greatest, the greatest among you shall actually be your what? I mean, I'm, I'm personally convicted, you know, just by reading this. Like, I don't have that on my business card, servant. I don't have that on my LinkedIn account. And I don't know if I've ever told anyone all I want to be in life is, well, really, really just a, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Oh, I like this. And whoever humbles himself will be what? Exalted. James wanted to be identified as simply servant. You see, if our identity is, is wrapped up in being a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, then you can go to verse 2. Then you can go to verse 2 and count it all joy when you meet various trials. Oh, if you're trying to create a personal branding, if you're trying to exalt yourself, if you're trying to get your name out there, if you're trying to do all of those things, man, when trials and tribulations come, if our identity is packed up in our personal branding, oh, we're not going to understand what God's trying to do in our life. If our identity's caught up in our job, our relationships, then when we meet various trials, we don't count it all joy. Oftentimes, we're emotional wrecks. You see, the Christian life, if we're honest, fundamentally is about our identity. Who are we? That's why today, if we're honest, there's an attack on identity. Identity. And on its basic level, there's gender confusion. It's a really dark and satanic delusion, an attack on identity. Identity is also a prime reason as to why we cannot conquer and have victory over bondage in our lives. I am this, I am that, and therefore you will always be. The enemy could tell you you're going to always be an alcoholic. You're going to always be this way. You're going to always be that way. I wasn't created an alcoholic. Alcohol is a drug that we make, take into our system. It's a choice we make. But you can see how the enemy attacks our identity. Notice who he was a servant to. Was it Rome? Was it Caesar? No. He was a servant to God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I just tell you today, Jesus Christ is worthy of our serving. Because all through the book of James, he refers to Jesus, not just as a good man, not just as a good prophet, as Lord. This would have been very offensive to the Jewish people. Jesus acknowledged that he was God. He's worthy. James' spiritual identity is all wrapped up in Jesus Christ. Let me ask you some questions of reflection. Number one, Whose brand are you building today? Is it yours or is it Christ? Who do you really want to exalt? Let me ask you this. Is Jesus Christ Lord of your life? Is he Lord of your life? Is he the centerpiece of your life, not just one sphere out here that you're trying to, man, I mean, I got relationships, I got, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I've got this going on, I've got to work, I mean, I've got a career, I've got, oh, yeah, 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 and then by the way, I do, I do have this thing over here called Jesus, I am a Christian, and I would submit to you that Jesus Christ needs to be right in the center. He needs to be Lord of our life. Would you rather people know who you are 
or know who Jesus is. You see, once we get our identity solidified in the resurrected Jesus, then we can move on to verse 2. Perhaps the reason we don't take verse 2 well in our lives is because we haven't identified ourselves with the resurrected Jesus Christ. Man, whatever you're going through today, Jesus is alive. That seems to work. Jesus is alive. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now, I love the word various. I love the word various trials. In fact, underline that in your Bible or highlight it. The word various. The definition for various is different from one another, all kinds of trials. A to Z. There's not a trial list here. It doesn't specify burned at the stake, bit by a snake, five times received from the Jews, 40 lashes. It means all kinds of trials, whatever we're going through, various trials in our life. Whatever I'm up against, whatever temptation I'm facing, it's really a formula here, isn't it? When this happens, then do this. It's a playbook, if you will. If they line up this way, then make this call. It's a response to the everyday circumstances we're going through in our lives. I was explaining to my wife, Stacy a while back how quarterbacks call an audible. Y'all know what an audible is? I wish LSU would have called some kind of audible yesterday in Alabama. Anyway, not to get into all of that. They call it an audible. I, I was explaining to her that sometimes quarterbacks come up to the line and they see something, they see a circumstance that they weren't quite ready for, and then they respond to that by calling a what? They call an audible. And that lets everyone know what's getting ready to happen. The whole team knows. They have to be flexible when an audible comes, when last-minute changes happen, when temptations come. (laughs) Ultra planners hate calling audibles. But sometimes I feel like ministry at times is just one big audible, isn't it? Let me give you some life realities quickly. Number one, the only constant in life is change. How many of you noticed that? Phew, if I could just get six months of steadiness, and it just seems like there's always something changing. Here's the good news. Number two, I want you to know God never changes. God never changes. He's the same. Your life may feel like change all the time, but God never changes. So when you go through a trial that you didn't know what was coming, you call an audible. What's the audible? Count it all joy. Count it all joy. Count it all joy when you face various trials. What are you facing today? What are you up against? What's in your life right now? It seems to be terrible advice. Count it all joy? Well, I think Peter gives us some answers to that question as well. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. How do we have a living hope? Oh, it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready ready to be revealed in the last time. Now look at verse 6. In this... In what? The resurrected Jesus. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, one of my favorite verses, if necessary, you have been grieved with, here's that word again, by what? Various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here's a life reality. Be number three, a better day is coming. It's coming. You say, how is that coming? And look, at the end of the day, like in Christ, 
Our hope is in the resurrected Jesus. There's a better day coming. Number four, good things are happening even though I don't see them. Good things are happening even though I don't see them. And then I realize too that whatever we're going through in life, it's temporary. Y'all know what temporary means? It's just for a little while. It's just a season. And most people ascribe philosophy, you've ever heard it, I don't know if you have, no pain, no what? Gain. And people go to a gym and pay for pain. Isn't that ridiculous? I'll do that. Last March, I paid $100 to run 13 miles in the mountains. How ridiculous is that? That's crazy. I went, I paid for trials. Why? Because I know when I cross the finish line, I'll know it had, it had all been worth it. It'll have been worth it because God developed me. You know how many millions of dollars people spend every year to go into a gym and pay for trials? Like, put more weight on, put more weight on. But when it comes to our faith, Oftentimes, we're not as resilient, are we? I've never seen anyone get offended at the barbell, cuss it out, and leave the gym. Man, that barbell didn't make me feel good. So I'm leaving. No, the next day they come back, they pay their bill, and they're going through trials. Can I just tell you that sometimes and most times God uses pain and trials to help grow us. We all know that. We all know that. And James is saying, count it all joy. Whenever we face relational conflict, whenever we go through something, we count it all joy. In fact, I found that the very things that we try to run away from, those are actually the things that God wants to use to take us to the next level. Pastor Michael Foster from Ohio said it best, nothing grows a Christian like a serious commitment to a single church week in and week out for years and years. Phew, isn't that the truth? Not conferences, not social media, not even personal devotions. The local church is where mature Christians are slowly forged in the fires of mundane faithfulness. Phew. That's the truth, isn't it? God uses pain and trials and struggles to grow us, to take us to the next level. The Bible also says that we know that the testing of our faith produces steadfastness. Steadfastness. Steadfastness is the thing that keeps us going. You see, counting it all joy means passing the test when we go through it, not just taking the test. Did we pass the test? 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Sometimes it means working through conflict, working through different things that we're going through in our life. It grows us. It takes us to the next level. James, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you go through various trials. I was with a pastor this week who sat across from me practically weeping at the church that God had called him to pastor. The former other pastors had made a wreck of it, and he said, God has just called me at this point to be a punching bag for hurting church members who are just mad at everything. I'm just going to love these people through their pain and show them the love of Christ. Well, you and I sometimes come to crossroads, come through trials, come through different things that grow our faith. God is faithful. Count it all joy, my brothers, whenever you go through various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces a far greater reward. What are you facing today? What are you up against? 
What's your title? If it's just a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, then maybe it'll affect how we go through trials and tribulations. God help us to make much of Jesus Christ and not ourselves. Amen, church? Father God, thank you so much for James, who quite honestly, all through the book, God, just challenges us, Lord. Whatever we're going through today, whatever we're up against, Father God, we pray that we would be able to, as James says, count it all joy whenever we face various trials. It's have to be big things. They're just decisions we have to face. God, as we go out of here today, help us to lean on and trust in the resurrected Christ. There's a better day coming for us. Thank you for that wonderful promise, Lord. And God, we love you today. Would you work among your people this morning? And I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. I need you now to do the same thing for
Father, thank you for this time this morning. God, I ask that you were glorified. Lord, as you, as you work through your church, I just ask, Lord, that each one of us would surrender fully to you, recognizing that we, we are slaves to you, Christ. And you are the only worthy master. It is not a burden for us to serve you, God. It is, it is our purpose. We are most satisfied. We are most fulfilled when we are serving you. God, I just ask that this church, this body, that we, we would demonstrate that being a Christ follower is not a sad life. It is not, it's not burdensome. It is a life of joy. Lord, we don't have trials just because we are believers. Everyone has trials. Life is hard sometimes. It's a lot harder when we're alone. Thank you for showing me that I am never alone. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you are always by my side. God, I just ask that our church would model that to this city, to our community, to our state. Lord, that we are not alone. We walk this life by faith in Christ. And we can experience joy and true life because of you, Jesus your life, your death, your resurrection, and your ascension to the right hand of the Father. We are grateful for you, Lord. Let your will be done today. Thank you for Brother Josh sharing the word this morning, and I ask that you would just go before us in this week, give us opportunities to be a light to this world. Father, we love you. In Christ's name, amen. Church, you are dismissed. We will see you next week. God bless you.